Well, hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Can you raise your hand just to see that uh, we're still all together here after that change? Okay. So today's talk is around chronic pain, uh, solutions for chronic pain, um, the DOC program two, which is the direct your own care program. And I've taken the liberty of using a lot of information from what I do as my regular practice um, every day in my office for patients with chronic pain, as well as the direct your own care program from backincontrol.com, uh, written by David Hanscom, my colleague previously in Seattle, who's had chronic pain himself for many years and went on to develop this program from a scientific perspective. And he was using it for many years with his patients in Seattle. He's now a retired um, surgeon and he continues to do the work on a bigger scale. So welcome and thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here once again for number two. I saw I could make it last time live, but we are live this time. So the first screen, I shared this last time, it's my pain pyramid that I created to illustrate different aspects of how do we find solutions? How do we, how do we treat chronic pain? So today we're gonna to be talking about emotions, uh, particularly the heart and also breathing. Um, last time we talked about um, simple activities like writing and the neuroscience, which we'll cover again today briefly, because I think it's really important to go over that. Last time we talked about thinking, and down at the bottom there on the pyramid, you've got nutrition and movement, which is the second and third webinars coming up in subsequent months. So lots of different aspects to this. And I like this diagram because in the middle of the pyramid, you can see that glowing light, which illustrates really the heart. And at the end of the day, um, we're going to optimize what we're doing with our emotional heart as well as what we're doing with our brain. Because I think both are really important to optimize our healing journey with pain. So this is my goal for everybody listening to this, whether we're live or from the, the website, is to take charge of your situation. Because often people feel disempowered, they go through a system that they're looking for answers and they end up discouraged, they've got very little understanding why chronic pain is going on and why chronic pain is not going away. And um, the hope is the tools that you're going to get over these four webinars are going to make you in charge, like driving a car. You know, often with people with pain, it's like you're in the passenger seat or the back seat and you've got no control. But if you jump into the driver's seat, you start driving, you're in charge. And just that sense that you're going forward in a direction with hope and also with possible solutions for you. So to review the definition of pain, it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such. Just a few things further than last webinar to review here is most of the time pain is described in terms of damage and it's not actually tissue damage. Because we know from injury, that you know, two to three months after specific soft tissue injuries, the, the tissue damage is over. The body has healed. But unfortunately, chronic pain continues. So often that is what we're dealing with. And also in the first section there, it's an emotional experience. We must deal with pain as an emotional experience because when we do, there is a hope that we can actually resolve it or at least reduce it. Whereas if we just focus as pain as a sensory experience, something you feel in your back or your neck, say, or anywhere in the body, then we're not dealing with the brain and we're not dealing with the heart, which is fundamental to understanding and also treating this chronic condition that affects one third of the adult population around the world. And that's for adults and the statistics for children or teenagers is in the 20 and the, the teens are 20. Percent um, amount as well. So this is a universal problem we have, and one of the reasons for this is we're not looking at it properly because we are not looking at the actual definition, and that's what we're hoping to achieve through these webinars. 
So let's go back to a little bit of science. I just want to bring this in again, just as a reminder. This is a diagram that we learn at medical school or science school uh, regarding acute pain. And it's just like, say you touch a burning hot oven and you remove your finger very quickly. That's acute pain. And we are, um, in an instant, we are aware that our hand needs to come away like this. And in an instant, uh, what happens is you touch the burning stove, there's a signal goes up your arm through the um, afferent neurons, which just means the, the nerve all the way to the spinal cord. In this case, it would be my neck, and it would come back down the arm through the afferent neuron, which is another nerve, to stimulate the movement in the muscles of the hand. So you remove your hand quickly. And then literally milliseconds later, the signal goes up to your brain, and then you feel pain where your hand is. And in this diagram, you can see where the leg area is and the arm area. So that's the area of the cortex of the brain, which is the outside of the brain, which is stimulated. And then you know consciously that your hand or your finger is burnt. So this happens so fast that we cannot be con conscious of it. It's just an automatic process. But the unfortunate thing with chronic pain is this is not not really going on. There's other aspects of the brain involved and we need to understand that. So the problem is we need to move away from the body as, as a, um, a piece of machinery, looking at it mechanically, and we need to move towards expanding the understanding of pain. And the science now looks at the mind and the body and the brain, and the gut, and even the heart. And even in this, preparing for this talk today, I added back in the heart, because that's the, the core of what we're talking about. And I think it's really important to understand that. First, we're gonna review epigenetics. Epigenetics, again, a review slide, because this is relatively new for most people listening to this. Most of my patients who I'm talking to every day are, are not aware of this, term epigenetics, which essentially means the environment that you live in shape your DNA. So what happens is, is when we have an experience, we could be a child, we could be a teenager, we could be an adult, or we could be living our life right now going through a difficult experience. And what happens is we have thoughts and we have emotions to that experience. And these thoughts and emotions are creating a response in the brain to produce neuropeptides. Now these are small little proteins that are produced in the brain every time you have a thought and an emotion. And what happens is these little proteins travel around the blood system, just like the red blood cells or the white blood cells and all the nutrients in your blood. So they travel around the blood system and they're taken to every cell in the body. And they, from there, this information is taken up into the cell, into the DNA of the cell, and then the DNA programs the function of that one cell. And the fact is, you and I have approximately 30 trillion cells in our body. And these are being influenced by many factors, but one of them is our thoughts and our feelings. So if you're going through stress, if you're going through hard times, if you're going through chronic pain, your body is being programmed for more chronic pain. And we know from some studies in Chicago in 2013 that showed after three months of, chronic, of a pain experience, say from an injury, then what happens is the limbic system of the brain takes over and literally runs the autom automatic process of controlling pain. So if this is true, then the wonderful hope that comes with epigenetics is that we have the ability to reprogram our brain. And I'd really like to ask you just to stop and think about that for a minute, because many of us have had pain for many years, me included, for many years, and um, before I was able to resolve it. And we're stuck in this mindset that we can't change it, it's not possible. And I'd like to share with you today that it is possible to reverse the programming of your brain and therefore heal. So this is a picture of the limbic system and it's a complicated picture, but I'd like you to focus just in the middle part of the brain 
This is just directly behind your eyes. And it's got lots of areas that control, for example, the hippocampus controls memory. The thalamus is the gateway to pain as it heads up from the spinal cord to the cortex. That's the, the, um, the outer edge of the brain there. You got the hypothalamus edge of the, of, the, of the limbic system, and that's controlling your hormones. And the amygdala right in the heart of this area is all to do with emotions. So these are areas as well as the other two um, above there are all involved in the limbic system. And this is the area that becomes dysfunctional with chronic pain. And many of you maybe with chronic pain have got other things going on. Maybe you have sleep problems, maybe you have emotional problems, depression, anxiety. Maybe you've got learning problems or memory problems, which all happens and can co co-exhibit with your chronic pain. And it's so difficult to heal this condition if all these factors are um, dysfunctional. So by doing this work, we're literally retraining the whole center of your brain towards a healing journey. Neurotags, these are, this is a pictorial um, version of what is literally going inside or going on inside your brain right now. In the, corti in the cortex of the brain, that's the outer side of the brain, you're literally having neurons that are collected together. These are termed neurotags by Professor Lorimer Mosley in Australia. And he describes them as these are pictorial ways of describing your perceptions. Say a perception of what you meant, or a memory, or an immune function. You know, when you come across a common cold virus and it hits you in the head and you end up having a cold, well, there's one of these neural tags being triggered and immune cells are being and stimulated from this part of the brain or control from this part of the brain. And also movement, when you move your finger, and also your thoughts. So the different things that we're doing all, the day, all day, every day, we don't really think about it, are being controlled by areas of the brain like this. And they're all interconnected. And the hope with this module is to really form new neurotags. One great summary that's really come to to be very obvious to me in, in the latter months is this role of this parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. And without really diving into the details of the slide, because that's less important, it's just to bring up the concept that we need to be relaxed in our body, in our muscles, in our nervous system, in our brain, in our life, and I think also in our relationships. I think also in social circumstances. You know, um, and if we're relaxed and have that approach, then our body can go into this healing modality. So very, very important. And a lot of the stuff we're talking about today um, heads towards a more pronounced parasympathetic nervous system, which helps reduce tension and increase blood flow to the areas of the brain and to the body. So activity, step one. So today we're gonna to talk about breathing. Breathing is the fundamental thing we all do every day. Um, without it, we're, we're dead in, in minutes. And it's essential for you controlling your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So let's read a few different ways of doing this. So this is what I encourage you to do if you're pain and also my patients, is stop and breathe for three breaths and do it throughout the day. And if you're in front of a computer, then you can look at the clock and you can see the change of the hour. Or if you're at home and got more time, you can look at the clock. You can just stop and pause and breathe three times. And what that does is switches you from a sympathetic drive to parasympathetic drive, the more relaxation phase of the nervous system. And when you do this, your breath slows, your heart rate slows. And at the same time, your muscles will start to relax and the blood flow will improve to the muscles. And often the areas are just predominantly where we experience um, pain, whether it's the, the, uh, the muscles or the soft tissues around them. So by doing this, you literally control how your nervous system works. And we can all do this by simply stopping and taking a slow deep breath. So I'll demonstrate and if you're in a safe environment right now, so that means not in a car driving, but if you're in a safe environment, you're relaxed, you can do this with me. 
So you just breathe in slowly through your nose. And count to three, four, or five if you can, and then exhale through your mouth. So when you're doing this, purse your lips, make a small sound, and do it for five seconds or so on the exhalation. And this will literally help you relax, and it will make you feel, hopefully, better, but it will start to improve your physiology and how you can prevent pain getting worse. Second, if you're in a pain situation, I would recommend you do this for five to 10 minutes. You can do it for longer if you wish. And if you do this, you will literally change your sympathetic drive to the parasympathetic, and you're literally controlling your pain levels right there and then. It's so important to be aware of how we're breathing and um, we can literally reduce those pain scores down from a hopefully a high level to a lower level. Next, belly breathing. This is a great um, approach to, to breathing either all the time, if you're used to being conscious of how you're breathing, many people who do yoga will know what I'm talking about. And many people who've done this over the years are abdominally breathing or belly breathing all the time. And that's kind of the, the goal, if possible. Because when we're breathing with our abdomen, then we're literally stimulating this parasympathetic drive called from the vagal nerve. It's the, one of the large nerves from the brain that comes down into your heart and your lungs and your intestine. We're stimulating the vagal nerve, which then helps to relax our brain and also our body. So with this, you just breathe in slowly and just take attention to your abdomen and allow your abdomen to go out as you inhale. So you breathe in and let your abdomen come out. And then as you exhale, just suck in your abdomen. And if you suck it in, it's way easier to push it out on the next inhalation. So that's belly breathing, highly recommended. And if you are practicing this and you know what this is, then do this as part of your three breaths a day. So three breaths throughout the day as you practice. And then the next is binaural meditation. So I'd like you to write this down, binaural meditation, or you can copy it from the website later. This is, what this means by is two, and Oral is hearing. So bioral or binaural is how you pronounce it, and meditation. Now there was a study done back in the 80s and 90s that showed the pain requirements during surgery and a variety of different surgeries was reduced when these sounds were played into the patient's ears. So these patients were um, asleep, they were anesthetized, and they had the sounds going into their ears and the the amazing thing with this is when you've got earphones in or earbuds like this, um, there's alternating sounds left to right that go on over and above the nice music that you'll be listening to. And what this does is it stimulates the brainstem and also the limbic system to learn how to relax and to learn how to optimize the parasympathetic nervous system. And the work with um, Beth Darnell, she's a um, a clinical professor down in Stanford who's been doing research on this with chronic pain situations with patients. And she found with her outcomes that when you do this for 20 minutes a day, and when you do it for three months, you literally, not only do you reduce the pain scores out of 10, not only do you improve your negative thinking, but you also enlarge parts of the brain the neocortex, that's the outside part of the brain, you enlarge about three different areas that have shrunken because of the chronic pain experience. And we know this because we did function, they did functional MRI scans every month on patients for one year. And this is what they found, was literally changes in the nervous system. So it's very heartwarming to realize that when we work at this and we put a lot of effort into it, we literally are changing our physiology to help our outcomes. So step two of the DOC program, Direct Your Own Care program, covers for 
forgiveness and love. And I've added in another section of gratitude because I think it's very important. And these three areas, I think, are fundamental to people moving beyond not just the reducing pain experience, because all the things we've talked about today and last time are regarding pain reducing activities, but we're moving on to deeper issues that unless they're dealt with, I do not think people can progress very well or successfully, especially with the, the, the longer um, experience of chronic pain. So forgiveness. So my question to you is, do you hold any grievances, any grudges about anybody, any, anything, maybe an event that happened, it could have been 50 years ago. Do you have any grievances about anything? And the reason for that is we become unhealthy in our brain and also the emotional heart, which we'll talk about a little bit as well later, um, is affected. And it's like a trauma or an ongoing stress to your brain. And the big thing with forgiveness is, is it's really about you. You know, many bad things happen and unfortunate things happen to, our, to us in our lives. And it's sometimes very difficult to forgive and to move on. But remember, it's not about forgetting, it's about forgiving. And what is needed is a decision. Prime thing is to decide I must forgive. And the reason is it's for your health. You forgive other situations and other people because it helps you and it helps heal you from the brain and from the heart perspective. Now this can be complicated and tricky. And if you need extra help, by, by um, talking to a counselor or a psychologist, I recommend that you do that. But for many people, it's about an awareness, it's about a decision, they do it and they move on and their life starts to get better. So the first thing is just to let go. Whatever that may be, just let go. Make a decision and let go of it. Second thing, it may be something you have to do every single day. Maybe it's a mindset or a thought process you have many times through the day. So every single day we need to make that choice. And if you've chosen forgiveness, no matter the feelings you may have about that situation of person, you've chosen to forgive and therefore you're moving on down the journey of feelings and emotions that are often attached to the chronic pain experience. Next, we'll bring up the, the subject of gratitude. And this ties into the emotional heart and it's something that I think if we practice on a daily, brace, daily basis, really it can, um, it just basically lifts your spirit and it really helps to calm down your brain and it makes you feel good. And if we've got feeling good um, hormones flying around our body and neurotransmitters in our brain, then we are literally allowing the nervous system to heal. So you may think, well, I've got very little to be grateful for. Well, I would challenge you on this because I think there's many, many things that you can be grateful for. The question is, what is healthy in your body? You know, you may have pain in your neck or your back, but what can you do? You know, basic functions. You can eat food. You can go to the washroom. You know, you can, you know, you can use your hand to drink tea or, you know, very simple things that we all take for granted. Start focusing on what is good and healthy in your body. Other things, family, friends, loved ones, most of, most of us have these people in our lives. So take some time to be grateful for these people. It's very important to optimize how you're feeling in your heart. Another step forward is express this to people, you know. Um, it's very empowering when you hear, the, hear and talk what you're thinking in your head. Very, very powerful. Comes back to the affirmations that I um, encourage people to do as well. When you talk something out loud, it becomes more real. And you're also creating um, brain with neurotransmitters and the whole hormonal component of it as well. And my encouragement with gratitude is make it a lifestyle. Make it a lifestyle. And then you're on the path of enjoying it. You may have still pain, but you're enjoying your life in spite of your pain. So the references for this section, for Forgive for Good by David Luscombe in Stanford, Anatomy of the Spirit 
by Carolyn Mice, she's a PhD, and in the Energy Codes by Dr. Sue Mortar. These are authors and doctors who I've followed and read their literature on the subject of healing with forgiveness and the heart. And there's a ton of research behind this. I think one thing I'll mention, um, my slides just jumped um, a few ago, and I just bring up the subject of heart math. Heart math Institute in California have been doing studies on the heart brain connection for over 20 years. And they've clearly shown that we communicate with our heart through different ways. You know, we can communicate with hormones, you know, feel good hormones like dopamine and um, norepinephrine. We've got pulses, literally your heart, when you're feeling good, your, your heart rate has a nice smooth rhythm. You can measure that with certain EEGs, if it's the brain or if it's the heart, you can measure with ECGs. And you literally get a pulse form. So a biophysical um, connection between the heart and all the way up to your body, but also to the brain. So that's the second connection. Um, the third connection is electromagnetics. You know, and I'll give you an example of this. If you're in a room with somebody you love or somebody you are close to, then you feel good. Whereas if you are in a room with somebody that you really don't like, there's a tension in the room. And the question is, well, what is that tension? What is that? Why do you get these feelings depending on who you're with? And the reason is electromagnetics. And the studies done at HeartMath have clearly shown that we're connected to not just ourselves through electricity, but we're connected to other people through magnetism or electromagnetism. And it's fascinating listening to some of the talks at HeartMath um, on this subject. But they've done the science behind it and proves that when we engage our heart in our life and our activities, we're literally helping heal our brain, which then helps to heal our body. So a lot of science has been done on this subject. So let's move on to step three. I just want to check the time here. Okay. Step three of the DOC program. Moving forward, it's really important to implement some of these practices or all of these practices into your life. And working with patients every single day, the ones who are doing really well are the ones who integrate this. So one, commit to a daily practice. I suggest 30 minutes a day. If you've got more time, you can do more time, great. But commit every day to sit down and do these activities that we've been talking about in the webinars. Create a safe haven in the family. Very, very important. David Hanscom, um, the author of vacuumcontrol.com, um, talked to me about this and he described how important it is when families are a place where you can be and enjoy and it's not the place for conflict. If you've got conflict, you need to take it outside the house. Maybe you need to go to a counselor. Maybe you need to, to go and talk to a friend, but not to live in a conflict environment because that just exacerbates the brain and stress and emotions and therefore leads to more pain. Get organized. Get an organized plan. If you are doing things that um, are not maybe advantageous for your current, current, current pain plan, stop them. Maybe, and then integrate some of these um, tips that we're, we're listening, uh, listening to today here. Get connected with you. Get connected with the life that you do have. Very important. Most of us are going about our life in automatic pilot. And we don't really think about what we're doing. So the encouragement here is just to stop and pause and connect with what you're doing right now. Maybe you're, um, maybe you're having a meal. Maybe you're going to phone a friend. Maybe you're going to walk your dog. Whatever you're doing, just be very present with what you're doing and connect with it. Very, very important. And that's a form of active meditation. And the next is create your vision. What is your vision for your health? What's your vision for your pain? What's your vision for your life? Sit down and write these things down. Put them in paper. Review them. Go back to them in a week's time, in a month's time. See how you're getting on. Create your vision. Very, very powerful. And the next and last step today is step four. So we're going to expand your consciousness, Dr. Hanscom talks about. And there's several subjects in this which is just really important with chronic pain. One is anxiety. When you're in chronic pain, anxiety goes together with it. 
you know, you cannot separate anxiety from pain and pain from anxiety. They coexist together. And the important thing here is to embrace it. Be frank it. Because anxiety is just a thought process that literally triggers the whole pain process. And if you just embrace it, do some breathing. Breathing is very, very helpful for this, just like we've been talking about today. Strongly encourage you to spend you know, several minutes, um, even five, 10 minutes, just breathing if you've got lots of anxiety. I have a patient who comes to mind who got severe anxiety while driving, and he needs to pull over 70% of the time because he's so anxious he goes into panic attacks. And by implementing some of these strategies, he's been able to calm down his anxiety so he can literally just get on with his drive and not having to stop. So these are very real and very effective ways of dealing with anxiety and pain. Live an engaged life. We've been touching on that already. Fail well. It's okay if you try these things and it doesn't work. It's okay if you try some of the techniques that were, for example, forgiving and you're not able to forgive. It's okay. If you've been, you know, if you forget to do some breath meditations for two days, it's okay. And often what happens, we get self-judgment in our, in our mind, in our heart, which then causes more stress and more pain. So it's, it's important to be compassionate towards yourself, to show self-love. And that's one of the cardinal features of mindfulness, which embodies much of the teaching in cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain. So fail well. Big picture, the spiritual path. And we're gonna talk about that in a few different slides here. So this is just taking it bigger than ourself and looking at our lives. Spend quality time with the family and friends. I've touched upon that already. Very, very important. If you're talking, just talk. You know, if you're having a meal, just have the meal with them. Don't be on your, your phones being distracted. Be very present and just enjoy that experience. Spiritual organizations, many people have got faiths and um, it's really important to focus on that. If that's important to you, spend time and enjoy that experience. For others, and everybody I hope enjoys good food, and if it's for them, a glass of wine. Whatever you're doing, really enjoy those experiences. Energizing experiences. One patient comes to mind is a patient who self-recovered from uh, breast cancer, and she has got chronic pain as well. And what she does every day is she looks for moments to laugh about experiences, um, about herself mainly, but also other people, or comedy shows, or just things in life that are quirky or humorous, and it just revitalizes our whole being. And I love that quote in Proverbs that says, laughter is the best medicine. And I think it is because literally it's a whole body treatment. It's your heart, it's your brain, it's your nervous system. It's like you're getting a little trampoline um, effect by jumping up and down, moving your lymph, moving your blood, blood flow around the cardiovascular system. Your whole body gets rejuvenated when we have energizing experiences. So. That's something that I strongly recommend. Creative hobbies, if you really love doing something, I've got a good friend who loves to climb walls and he gets lots of, lots of kick out of that. Whatever gets your adrenaline up, do that. And, but of course, you've got to be safe at the same time. And finally, the arts, very holistic. You know, if you enjoy art, if you enjoyed lots of different type of arts, um, it's very therapeutic just to be present with that. And just to the final slide on this spiritual path, silver lining. I think at the end of the day, it's really important that we stop and we're grateful for even the pain experience. Now, this may be hard for some people to accept, but it's my experience with patients when they've suffered for so long and they're realizing, well, what is the point of all this? What's the point of life? What's the point of... What's the point of pain? And I think one of the reasons and purposes of pain is to waken us up to our bodies. Because often we go through life unconscious, as I've said before. And pain helps us stop in our track and start to be appreciative of what we do have. And it's my big hope that when you implement a lot of these practices, that you're, when your pain levels go down, that you literally will be grateful because you've learned how to consciously change your nervous system. You've learned to consciously be connect 
with maybe family members or friends that you really didn't connect with before. Or, you know, you reattach to a spiritual organization that you previously weren't attached to. And the reason I, I'm bold enough and courageous enough to speak this on a webinar that will go live in, and also in, that will go on the website is because of a man, because of, because of a man called Viktor Frankl. And he was a guy, he was a psychiatrist who went through the concentration camps in Auschwitz for many years. And he came out of that experience and because he found within the depths and the dire straits of the concentration camps in World War II, that he found a meaning in his suffering. And he went on from that, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. I thoroughly recommend that as a, as a, as a tool to help you through this subject if, if you're struggling with it. And he came to America, and he created his own form of psychotherapy in America. And he was able to help people understand their suffering because, and through the meaning of it. And this is a very deep and um, very, very personal subject for many people. But I just encourage you to read this book. And I'll just finish, as we've mentioned already, it comes back to gratitude. Gratitude in your day. Have gratitude before you go to sleep at night. Have gratitude before you get up in the morning. And let gratitude be a language of your heart and a language of your mind. And I really think that will help a lot in reversing or reprogramming the, the brain neural networks that are laid down right now with your crime. So for more information, backincontrol.com. Back in and I'm going to hand over to Heather. Heather, do you have any questions uh, um, for me from the... Actually, I just opened it to check, and there's no questions at this moment, but um, I'm sure folks will be starting to think of some of them and um, begin to type them in. I, I have to say, from the things that you're saying, that's how I've changed my life, and I'm healthier and stronger and doing more with less pain than I ever thought possible. So these things are some of the answers to reducing our own pain. So, yeah, heartwarming to hear them being taught all over and, and we do teach as many much of this as possible in our group to do so. Well I have a I have a medical student who's with me today. Um, any questions first? I have a medical student with me today who's got questions as well so I'll take her question. But yeah any questions from the, the audience? Not yet, no. Okay so I'll, I'll just listen to Sophie. Most challenging to them, and this. Most challenging. Yeah. Okay. So Sophie's asked me. She's a medical second year medical student at UBC, and uh, she's asked, well, "What's the most challenging aspect of this for for patients?" It's a very good question, Sophie. I think there's several things I need to say. I think one is not understanding what chronic pain is about because of the biomedical model of our bodies and how our medical system looks at back pain, for example, as a problem with your discs or a, a, a prolapsed disc, bulging disc, and they're given reasons like degenerative disc disease or osteoarthritis, and that's the reason for the pain, but they can't change it. And just learning that they actually control their brain, which controls their body. And now we're learning today we control our heart, which controls our brain, which controls our body. And that's one of the best liberating things of all, is that they move from a place of, I can't do anything, to my goodness, I can do something about it. So that, that would be one thing. I, say, I think the, to, to go forward in time, say patients know about these things, they're practicing them, but say they've still got pain. And that's a very, very tricky thing to deal with. And, I would say most people who struggle with this are the ones who have got uh, lots of anxiety, lots of depression, and, and uh, a negative mind, mindset uh, regarding pain. Because when these things are coexisting, then those need to be dealt with almost first before the chronic pain can really be dealt with. So. Um, you know, again, that's why we need our colleagues, our counselors, our psychologists, our psychiatrists, our family physicians who are, you know, can manage these types of symptoms and really take it on board. And um, 
This is why the, the teachings that we're sharing in the webinars is very complementary to the medical model because we do need all the different services within the medical model, but we need to add more, um, which, which is the whole per point of the, the patient and pain network um, and also the education that we're hearing today. All right. I do have questions now that have been coming in. Um, one sure. is, um, you had mentioned talks about electromagnetics. Um, she was wondering which talks you might be referring to. Sorry, the, which talks I'm referring to? Yes, she's, she's wondering what talks you were referring to. Okay. Electromagnetics. So, so if, you, if you want to read more, more on this subject, I, I would encourage you to read the book called Heart Math Solutions. Heart Math Solutions. It's uh, over 20 years old and got all the science around the electromagnetics of the heart um, is written in there. And um, if, you, if you Google HeartMath Institute, there'll be you know, wonderful resource for, for um, information, but also more up-to-date studies, because that book was to over 20 years old, um, and it's definitely been uh, improved upon, and the science behind this is, is definitely um, available. We just need to look in the right place, but that would be the best place to get more information. Nice. I'm writing these things down too. <laughs> um, another lady would like to know, um, she hears that people with hypervigilant systems may be better off not holding their breath in a breath exercise. Yeah, yeah. Um, good question. Well, I'm not an expert in, in mindfulness and breathing, but it comes down to this. What feels good for you and your body? If it doesn't feel right, don't do it. So, you know, we're all breathing. And if you just pause and just are consciously aware of the inhalation and then the exhalation, then you will still have the effect of calming your nervous system by just bringing focus attention onto that. All right. Another question. Um, how do you manage chronic pain when you were starting at ground level to start developing friendships but are very lonely as you go through a waiting period? Yes, it's, it's very challenging. And I think this is probably one of the most challenging things with, with people with pain because they end up getting isolated and, you know, they're on their own. And there's just another stress that they need to deal with. I think just, you know, sticking to the, the advice on webinar one and webinar two and just getting a program of you sit down and you do your breath work, you do your writing, express some of these feelings of loneliness. Um, you know, in the short term, I think expressing the negative experience is important, but then it's so important to move back to the, what is positive in your life. You know, and you know, there's 30 trillion cells in our body and they're all miraculously working all the time. And you know, there's 30 trillion reasons to be, to be grateful right there. So I think it's so important and we need to work hard at this sometimes. You know, the light coming through the window, the warmth of the sun on your skin. Um, just focus on things that, that lift your spirits up because it is extremely tough living with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And one thing I like to say on this subject, and it comes from David Clark, who is a, an author um, and he's a gastroenterologist who's worked with over 7,000 people with chronic pain and that subject is stress. And he calls every single one of his patients heroes. And it's very, very important that everybody's listening to this who's struggling in the depths of despair with this situation, that they too are a hero. Because getting up every day and just fighting for your life with this situation is awful. And unless you've got it, you have no idea what it's like. And I think from me to you, you need to know that and you need to start. Write that down a hundred times. I am a hero. And see what that does. Hmm. Um, if, if I can add just one thing there, I know people who come to our groups, the first thing that they say is they didn't know that they, somebody else could understand. So they get heard and understood, and, and that's a great place to start too. And um, people develop friendships, and they feel better, and then they develop other friendships as well. So um, sometimes just being understood is, is a magical turning point. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, one other question here. Uh, what do you think of energy medicine? This person is about to start a program. Yeah, energy medicine. Um, I'm fascinated with it. I study it. I practice it myself. Um, I do talk to patients about it. Um, on the slides there, I'll just go back. See if I can go back in the slides. Here's a, two wonderful books that I encourage anybody, if you're interested in this subject, um, Anatomy of Spirit by Caroline Mice, written in 1996, and also The Energy Codes, written by Dr. Sue Mortar, chiropractor. She's been working with, with um, energy medicine for 30 years. Her father was also involved with it. She, that energy code is wonderful, wonderful, um, almost esoteric principles or spiritual principles taken into science and taken into a level where you can understand energy. Because at the end of the day, through the study of quantum physics, you understand that our bodies and the whole universe is made up of energy, vibrations of energy. And we're just all vibrating at different frequencies. And these two authors have, have practices where they help people clinically in different ways, but helping people to, to grasp this amazing concept and bring it forward. And it's something that uh, I may teach on in, in the future, but for now, I need to um, study more and practice myself more before I go to uh, more of a, an open forum like this. Interesting. Um, another question. Uh, what can I do to help end the stigma of chronic pain? Um, example might be advocacy and how can I get involved? This person's asking. Yeah. Well, I think looking up pain organizations that are, you know, it depends where you live, but you know, BC here in Canada and we've got the patient and pain network, you can get involved there. Um, and also the pain BC, these are two big organizations that one of their, focuses is to get rid of the pain stigma. Um, you know, if you really wanted to, you know, go further in political levels and your MLA, um, I'm not too sure how to do that myself, but I would go with organizations who've got a voice and who are being listened to by governments and therefore probably the best way to achieve that. And I think the other thing is be it yourself. You know, Gandhi says, be the change you want to be be the change you want to see in the world. So you do it yourself and you be that and you bring that out into every day. And you never know who you may talk to, maybe a younger person, maybe a student, and who may go on and revolutionize the whole medical system or political system or whatever system may be because of your one conversation. So never belittle ourselves and what we do every moment and be present as much as you can with that. Okay. Two more questions have come uh, from Jennifer. How come we don't require empath empathetic training and higher levels of knowledge around ways to help people living with chronic pain from people who work in the insurance agencies such as ICBC, Extended Health, WorkSafe, etc.? That's a very good question. Well, insurance agencies um, are insurance agencies and their function is to be an insurance agency. So, you know, they're, I, I guess they're not tra trained in empathy. I guess they're not trained um, in this understanding of chronic pain. And I think to be fair to the insurance agencies and to be fair to the medical system um, as well as we're only as good as we are educated at the end of the day. And there needs to be more education. And I know within, um, I forget it was ICBC or Dip Works ABC, I was talking to a patient who works for this organization. They were saying that they had brought in a psychologist to help them train on this subject. So, and it's very frustrating because I know people don't feel that from the interactions with, with different organizations. But when I was in Boston last year at the World Congress in Pain, amazing statistic came out that maybe explains this. Because on average, it takes 17 years for something new to make it into the, the front line of medicine. Now, up to 20 years ago, that was reasonable because people had to send medical knowledge around the world by, by boat or by plane. 
we're going really far back and we're talking about boats, but you know, by plane. Whereas now you Google anything and we have the information, but systems take time to change and to evolve and to improve. And it's only through, you know, doing webinars like this, it's only by, you know, um, educating medical students and the system slowly making headway into this world of education that it will all change. But I think it may take a while, another 10 years maybe, but I think it's definitely going to come. Nice. That's a very nice way to put it. It does take time. And here I have a lovely, more of a statement than a question. It comes from Nancy. She says, I love, I am a hero, brilliant. How's Thank that? you, Nancy. That's cool. Thank you, Nancy. That's all the questions I have at this moment. Um, so I'll just say, if there's any questions that may come, please contact me, um, drwaynefimister at gmail.com, drwaynefimister at gmail.com. And we'll just, there is a few more slides to finish up. If you want these slides, uh, um, I'll maybe share the testimonies this week, because we have some time, if, I have time. So I'm going to share two stories that, that really impacted me in my journey with chronic pain. And the first one is Karen. Karen is a 60 year old plus lady who's now retired, was on narcotics for over 20 years, had several back surgeries, and was really struggling with chronic pain when she came to see me about three years ago now. And, you know, I've worked with Karen in two different ways. One has been through trigger point injections which is just a technique to release tension in the body. But the other way is through cognitive behavioral therapy, through what we're learning today. And she's really embodied many of these principles. And not only has she helped her pain, she's now retired because she's 65, but you know she's definitely got her life back. Her life has been completely transformed. And she's such a testimony just to the knitting grit of sticking in there and just doing the work and over time and it takes months it takes years for their brains to change and now she's off narcotics she's also lost 20 30 pounds and she's highly active almost on a daily basis with swimming and different activities so that's Karen and the other one is Julie Claire who I talk about in my TEDx talk and she's a woman with 49 years with chronic pain or narcotics for 49 years and she was had a very unfortunate childhood, let's put it like that, and ended up with chronic pain and traveled across the world looking for answers, found none in Holland, in America, and through, right across uh, Canada here. Went to five different pain clinics over her 40 years or so and had no answers. And when she came into my office, this was, oh, about three years ago now, I shared the story of John Sarno. And John Sarno was a physician in New York who in the 1950s realized that chronic pain has got something to do with emotion and stress. And it wasn't about your back x-ray and, and uh, degenerative disc disease or prolapse discs. It was something to do with the brain. It was something to do with the autonomic nervous system. And Dr. Sarno pioneered 50 years of work. And he was literally at the point where he said to his patients, and this is a very bold statement, and I used to say this to patients when I started this cognitive behavioral understanding of pain. And I said to Julie, look, You've got to tell your pain to go away. And you've got to do these affirmations. And you've got to do this. And she says, okay, okay, I'll do it. Four months later, her pain was gone. That was stump pain. It was from an amputated limb that was, had a gunshot wound when she was 16. And four weeks, her pain was gone. And it has not returned to this day. And she believed in what I was saying. She believed in affirmations. She believed that she could do it. She, her brain could change. And literally, the signals in her brain was able to switch off that pain. And I think I'm going to leave with this testimony. It's my own testimony, but it's also other people's testimony. I'm going to make it very practical. It is once you learn how to do this in your brain, you've got the connections, you've got the, the circuits, your body knows what to do to shut off the pain. And I know that's a long cry for most people's experiences because they struggle so much and for so long. But I've seen it myself with my chest pain. I've seen it myself with my knee pain. I've seen it in Julie. I've seen it in numerous patients who have programmed their brain enough. 
And all I just see, it, there is the potential that that can happen to you. If it doesn't happen, you work on it and you get the pain levels down. Maybe it won't go away, but your purpose in life and your um, quality of life through the different techniques we've shared, shared today will make your life more enjoyable. And just finally, the references, the, all the references I've read over the, over the um, years and for this talk. This is a thank you to everybody here. For more information on me, it's at wayneferminster.com. I do have a book called Conquering Chronic Pain, Solutions and Strategies for Those Who've Given Up Hope. That's um, on Amazon and uh, Kindle. I do have a podcast show which I interview top people around the world every week. And the show is over 50 now episodes and that's on iTunes, on um, iHeartRadio and um, I Spotify and they're really good because there are a variety of different people come on my show and we just talk about pain and how to help people in different ways. A live streaming I do talk live every week on Instagram and Facebook at seven o'clock on a Thursday night where I just share thought of the week and you know research I've, I've listened to or I've read or books I've read and just tips on helping you on an ongoing basis as we go forward. And, and also a TEDx talk that's um, on YouTube. Because it's a scientific talk this year, they didn't, um, if you Google my name, Wayne Finister and TEDx talk, you will not find it. But if you look up um, Bear Creek Park, Stan, um, Bear Creek Park TEDx, you'll get me as one of the presenters. And that was back in April of 2019. And that's on YouTube. And you'll get that talk on my uh, wayforminister.com as well. So if you're local, I'm in four clinics here in the Lower Mainland, available on a Monday and a Thursday in Abbotsford, and the details are there, and in, on a Tuesday in Fort Langley, and in Surrey, where I am right now, on a Friday. So these three Clinics are direct referrals by patients. You, know, you do not need a doctor's referral. You can get one if you want, but you can call and get an appointment. And my fourth clinic is Nagase, where I've worked for quite a while now, for over 10 years as a GP for, over, for about 10 years. But now I just do chronic pain, and that's available by fax only out in Nagase. And finally, workshops that I've got coming up in Abbotsford. I run them every third Thursday night at 7 p.m. in Abbotsford at the New Leaf Wellness Center where I work. And in two weeks time, I'm doing the Empowered Relief Workshop that comes direct from Stanford. And it's a wonderful two hour workshop. And a lot of the things we're talking about here, but it gives you a specific audio file from Stanford um, to, do the, to do the meditation. So that's coming up in the nutrition was last month and somatic movements, which we're talking about in the next webinar here is also going to be a rotating web and workshop for people who are interested and available in this part of the world. And you can just call, if you're interested in that, call the, the number 604-850-2511 to register for these workshops. So thank you everybody. And that's the end of the talk. It is. And thank you, everyone. And uh, keep a lookout for the invita invitation for the third one. It'll go out in the next uh, week or so. And uh, the recording will be on the website. And you should receive an email with a copy of the recording as well. So, But it will also be there. So thank you very much, Wayne. This has been very heartfelt and, and inspirational. So thank you so much for all of your time and, and sharing so much with us. And thank you all for being here. Yeah. Awesome.